Hey y'all, Webcam Parrot here to give an in-depth look at one of DC's most popular characters, Lucifer Morningstar. Now, Lucifer's chronology is a little confusing because of the large number of flashbacks and disagreements regarding canonicity of certain texts. In fact, the only thing that everyone seems to agree is canon is Lucifer Volume 1. I've even seen people try and say his original Sandman appearance isn't canon. But in this video, I'm going to be treating everything as canon, including the more recent Rebirth storylines, and I personally think that they all fit together just fine, and any that don't, I'll mention at the end. If you want to do it some other way, you're more than welcome to, but canonicity is kind of a fluid thing, and this is how I'm treating the canon before Lucifer Morningstar. And I literally read every single Lucifer comic appearance over the last four days, and I think that it makes sense, and it's also far more interesting and gives us more of an insight into Lucifer, especially in his earlier appearances, um, if we do include these other stories, and so that's why I'm going to be including them. His earliest showings chronologically are kind of mixed up between a lot of different storylines, thanks to things like flashbacks. So bear that in mind here, as there definitely is more than one way to organise them, and all I've done here is try and organise them as best I can, but there's different ways of doing it. Lucifer's story, of course, starts with his creation out in the Overvoid, by his father, the Presence, alongside his brothers Michael and Gabriel. At some point out in this expansive void, Lucifer laughed at its very blackness, and his laugh was swallowed by the void. Of course, the three brothers set about forging and shaping creation and its many aspects for their father, and once it was complete, we would see Lucifer meet up with the first wife of Adam, Lilith. Lucifer at this time, going by the name Samael, questions why Lilith chooses to partner herself with demons, and she answers that although she was made for Adam, she chooses to live for herself an idea that I think had a large impact on Lucifer's future decisions. Later, after an altercation between a young Mazakine and another angel would lead to the death of said angel. The angelic host, with the archangel Gabriel in particular, felt as though this warranted the death penalty, but Samael arrives to challenge him, saying that Gabriel was nothing but a drop of dew on a leaf compared to him. Following this, he renounces the name Samael and his birthright, taking the name Lucifer only. He abandons heaven, and a full third of the angelic host follows him. This leads to the first war in heaven, as angel turned upon angel. Lucifer, when challenged on this choice, would say that his way may lead to a dead end, or it may lead to the light, but either way, he chooses it for himself. However, the Presence turns up, offering Lucifer a realm of his own, that being Hell, which ends the war in Heaven, and begins a period of time where Lucifer ruled Hell. The First of the Fallen was already there before him, however, but his power was nothing compared to the Archangels, and so he left Lucifer to run things for quite some time. Relatively early into Lucifer's rule, there is an event known as the Wild Hunt, a hunt that spans all across creation as the attempt to slay the hunted god, and this wild hunt finds that it has slain its quarry in hell. Lucifer notices this, and being the asshole that he is, particularly at this time, arrives and claims that any being who suffers in hell cannot be allowed to leave. The other beings of the hunt are not pleased, but Odin, a mighty god in his own right, particularly at this time, fears Lucifer's power, and so makes a deal with him that he will instill a fear of hell into his worshippers, empowering it. But this isn't enough for Lucifer, who demands to be taken on the wild hunt during its next outing. It's worth noting as well that at this time, hell and Lucifer himself were still young from the perspective of Odin, as they had only recently come to the minds of men, which is where they both draw their powers from the beliefs of mankind, just like Lucifer's father, the Presence, which is something that I've spoken about at great length in another video. And what this basically means is that 
Lucifer is far weaker at this point in the story than he is at other points, and Odin should actually be stronger than he normally is, but despite this, he still seems to be wary of Lucifer's power. On this specific wild hunt, Lucifer easily slays the hunted god before Odin or the other hunters can do anything. But Lucifer isn't satisfied and asks what they're going to hunt next. Odin says that the hunted god will be reborn in the womb of another and that they will hunt it then. Lucifer finds this unacceptable, however, and burns the corpse of the hunted god into nothing with hellfire and begins his pursuit of it immediately killing it over and over again as a newborn baby, wearing away its very essence until there is next to nothing left at all. It would be over a thousand years before the hunted god would return again. Later, Lucifer sends some demon lords after the spectre, saying that the wrath of the spectre limits human freedom and is an enemy of hell that must be defeated. But he knows that they will inevitably fail and just gives them this task so that they don't have time to scheme against him. Etrigan, as a young child, was extremely reckless, powerful, and out of control. During this time, he puts on the Crown of Horns, a powerful artifact that is supposed to represent the current ruler of Hell, granting them immense power. However, as a child, Etrigan doesn't have the power to wield this artifact correctly, and starts tearing Hell apart by mistake. Belial, an incredibly powerful demon in his own right, tries to stop him and is unable to, only for Lucifer to arrive and easily deal with the situation, one-shotting this amped Etrigan. He then orders Belial to teach Etrigan discipline and control, but as they are leaving, Etrigan burns him, leaving a cross-shaped mark on his back. Naturally, this put Etrigan in Lucifer's bad books, which leads him to make a habit of tormenting the young demon. But this only puts the idea of rebellion in Etrigan's head, who begins to kill and usurp various demons throughout Hell, fighting his way up the chain of command. Lucifer is deciding what to do about this when Merlin arrives, suggesting a solution. And after hearing it, Lucifer approaches Etrigan, saying that, he sets the rules of this game, and then throws Etrigan into a portal, which leads to Merlin, who fuses Etrigan into Jason Blood forever, and we're left with the Etrigan that we're familiar with today. Years later, Etrigan seems to have accepted his place in Hell below Lucifer, and approaches him with an offer. That he will serve up Avalon, and the souls of Merlin and his companions. Lucifer says that Avalon is an abomination to all the afterlives, and that he would like to see it become a territory of hell. As a result, Etrigan burns all of his companions alive in Hellfire, sending them all to hell and into the clutches of Lucifer. However, it is worth noting that the enchantments surrounding Merlin's soulless body protect it from being harmed by Lucifer or the powers of hell. We then see Etrigan captured by the Questing Queen, and none other than the powerful Chaos Sorcerer, Mordru, although at this time Mordru was far weaker than he would grow to be later, as this is set during the time of Camelot. Mordru would use magic to force Etrigan to divulge his plan. You see, Etrigan knows that one of his companions, Madame Xanadu, will open a portal into Avalon in order to escape Hell granting Lucifer passage there. Mordru and the Questing Queen decide they want a piece of this plan, and so attach a tracking spell to Jason Blood so that they might overhear everything and join in when the action starts. Lucifer prepares his legion as Zanadu does exactly as they expect her to, and opens the portal so her companions can escape to Avalon. A spell placed on the magic orb that Xanadu uses for this by Etrigan prevents the portal from closing, and Lucifer steps through, announcing that his forces will have no trouble defeating the Shining Knights despite their immortality, as they are all experts at fighting beings that are impossible to kill. It's at this exact moment, however, that Mordru and the Questing Queen arrive with their own army, 
and the whole thing devolves into a three-way battle of grand proportions. Etrigan flies over to Lucifer, who seems to believe that the demon planned all of this, despite Etrigan protesting that he had no idea that Mordru and the Questing Queen would do this. Frustrated, Etrigan flies away, swearing that he will never serve anyone again. Merlin, soul now back in body, summons his own army consisting of some of Camelot's greatest heroes to help defend Avalon, including Arthur Pendragon, wielding none other than Excalibur itself. Merlin calls for them to recreate Rain, which they do, and Arthur reveals to Lucifer as they fight that all of this, the arrival of himself and Etrigan's plans and Mordru and the Questing Queen's plans, was all anticipated and predicted by Merlin from the beginning. Arthur slices off Lucifer's arm with Excalibur, and Etrigan flies over to Merlin, planning to kill him, saying that he had felt the mind probing of Mordru and knew that all of this would happen. But Merlin calls him on his bluff, saying that he knew none of this, and promptly zaps him with a bolt of lightning, sealing him back inside Jason Blood. Merlin is then made useful, and it's revealed what his plan has been the entire time. You see, the waters of Avalon sap the very essence of magic itself, dissolving the Questing Queen's army and forcing Mordru to flee. The carefully constructed ranks and hierarchies of Hell set by Lucifer also begin to be washed away by this rain. Lucifer claims that he could still easily overwhelm Avalon with a tide of simple evil, but Arthur reminds him that it would be at the cost of the hierarchies that entertain him so much. Lucifer accepts this and leaves, saying that they may keep his hand as he will simply grow another, which is very impressive considering how powerful Excalibur is and how fundamentally it cuts. Years later, we see Lucifer mocking Etrigan in Hell for renouncing his service to him, saying that he loves Etrigan's ambition because it always drives him to such spectacular failures. Etrigan is left in Hell for a long, long time, but eventually he swaps back to the Earth with Jason in order to help the Demon Knights combat the powerful vampire known as Cain and his army. Etrigan tells us that it's said that even Lucifer has no dominion over Cain, and so agrees to help. Back in Hell, we see Lucifer taunting Jason in much the same way that he taunted Etrigan earlier. Jason refuses to swap places because he knows that Etrigan needs to refill his power within Hell. Lucifer enjoys this as it means he gets to torture Jason and Etrigan suffers, two birds with one stone. His demeanor quickly changes, however, when he realizes that Cain walks the earth once more, and he tells Jason to immediately swap places. Now back in Hell, Etrigan tells Lucifer that he reeks of fear, that Cain would leave the world a soulless husk, and without souls, there is no purpose for Hell. Lucifer not only recharges Etrigan, but empowers him too, and asks him to deal with Cain, saying that he will owe him a debt in return. Etrigan helps ensure that Cain's vampire army is defeated, and he is forced to flee, but Cain claims that he will return again. I'm sure that this whole business about souls and, and Hell's purpose has more to do with Lucifer losing a great source of entertainment to himself, and not something that would actually affect him physically, but perhaps the fact that vampires don't have souls uh, affects the belief power that he would otherwise get from them, and he might fade out of existence as well. Either interpretation I think is fine. Later, Jason threatens the Morning Star with the use of the Holy Grail, and knowing the vast damage that its mere presence could do to Hell, Lucifer decides to fulfill his request to override Etrigan's curse and send him back with them now separated. Of course, again, I think this has more to do with Lucifer getting a lot of enjoyment out of the hierarchies and kind of like political maneuvering of Hell, and he doesn't want the 
Holy Grail to directly upset that. I don't think the Holy Grail has the feats to actually affect Lucifer himself negatively. Especially since later it's kind of implied to be the opposite of the Black Diamond that holds Eclipso, which I definitely don't think is on that level. Eventually, Cain gets his comeuppance when he is summoned to a hellish court before Lucifer, who sentences Cain to forever live within the walls of the House of Mystery, cursing him to suffer there for eternity. In another Etrigan comic, we see Jason Blood approach the pirate Captain Scum and his crew, saying that he wants them to escort him to a great tower that lies far out into the sea. A tower that houses sorcerers capable of breathing underwater, a skill they used to collect treasure from every ship that ever sank to the bottom of the ocean. Scum, of course, agrees to this, and in the meantime, we see an incredibly angry Lucifer, who after looking at a note, smiles in hellish glee. Eventually, Captain Scum's voyage, thanks to the help of Jason Blood, runs into this bizarre giant and bloody portal, which they cross, and after several more days, they finally reach the tower that Jason told them existed. They fight their way up the tower, only for Scum to suddenly realise he has made a huge mistake when he sees a Lucifer at the top. You see, years back, Scum sold his soul to Lucifer in exchange for immortality, and he's ten years past his due date. In another comic known as The Demon, Hell is Earth, that I've talked about before, so I'll be brief, we see that Belial, with the aid of Merlin's magic, has managed to overthrow Lucifer, keeping him in a cage beside his throne. Ordinarily, I would be skeptical of this, because Lucifer likes to play around with power dynamics, but Merlin just does explicitly come out and say that this Belial is the most powerful being to ever sit on Hell's throne, and he is being heavily amped by a special spell prepared by Merlin, who himself is incredibly powerful. I mean, Merlin is definitely aware of how strong Lucifer is. Belial would later use this power to turn Lucifer into a dog, kind of mocking him and making him his servant. However, a combination of Excalibur, which we've seen hurt Lucifer before, and the vast majority of Merlin's power, combined with Etrigan, is able to take out both this dog Lucifer and Belial. It is also worth noting that another demon lord known as Astaroth also thought that it would be possible for him to take over Hell and defeat Lucifer with a combination of Merlin's and Etrigan's powers before. So there is precedence for something like this happening, and it's not too outrageous for an even stronger Etrigan with Excalibur on top of it to be capable of deposing Lucifer and Belial like this. Obviously, Lucifer can't be killed so simply, and so presumably he uh, eventually regenerates and retakes the throne of Hell. But this storyline is still waiting for a sequel, so it could go anywhere, honestly. A combination of this and Crisis on Infinite Earths, when the Great Darkness showed up in Hell, would create the necessary power vacuum for other political groups. This was as a result of a large number of demons joining the Great Darkness and causing a civil war in Hell. And as Lucifer says here, this resulted in the formation of a triumvirate of Beelzebub, Azazel, and Lucifer himself. Hell would be run like this for quite some time. Uh, and it's not long after this that Dream arrives in Hell to retrieve his helmet from one of the demons there an artifact of great power for Morpheus. He plays a word game against the demon Koronzon, which he wins handedly, but as he is leaving, Lucifer asks him why he should let the King of Dreams leave at all. He has the entire might of Hell there, including its demon lords, and has no reason to let Morpheus go at all. In response, Dream addresses Lucifer and turns to the crowd, asking what would become of Hell if those imprisoned there were unable to dream of Heaven. They quietly let him leave, and Lucifer swears to take his revenge against Morpheus one day for the insult. In another comic, 
we would see Lucifer and the rest of the Triumvirate banish the beast with no name to the Earth for being too good. At some point, Belial replaced Azazel on the Triumvirate, and we would see Etrigan once again scheming to take control of Hell. Merlin tries to warn Lucifer of Etrigan's plans, but he seems completely unworried by the whole situation. We see Belial claim that he'll wait and see how the coup is going and pick a side based on who seems to be winning. Beelzebub is killed by Etrigan, but Lucifer still doesn't seem worried. Eventually, Etrigan recruits both his mother, Ramvadath, and Belial to his side as they storm the tower at the center of hell only for Lucifer to surprise them by surrendering instantly, seemingly unconcerned. As he did in the past, Etrigan claims the Crown of Horns and immediately turns on Belial, easily defeating him and casting him into the Abyss. He goes to do the same to Lucifer, who simply breaks free from his restraints, telling Etrigan that he can play his game if he wants, and that Etrigan is such a disappointment. He then flies away completely unharmed by anything Etrigan attempted. Not long after this, Etrigan would be brought back to Earth by his connection to Jason Blood thanks to the efforts of Merlin, ending his brief rule. We later see Lucifer comment on it, with him saying that Etrigan's temporary rule ultimately came to nothing. He says that all these demons that have at one time ruled Hell believed themselves to be his equal, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Which kind of says to me that during the Hell is Earth storyline I spoke about earlier, Lucifer could have easily regained control if he wanted to, and he simply didn't want to. But uh, I do still think that Belial and Etrigan at that time were more powerful than him. It's just that Lucifer is crafty and he has other ways of dealing with problems, as you'll see later. And I think he could have reclaimed the throne of hell easily, and it just wouldn't have been with raw power. In another little one-shot appearance, Lucifer would come for the soul of the Batman villain, Mr. Whisper, who had traded it for immortality, similar to Captain Scum, and now his time was up. Interestingly, this little comic line with Mr. Whisper was written by Grant Morrison and is very similar to his later Batman storyline involving Darkseid and Dr. Hurt. Back in Sandman, Dream decides he must return to Hell to free Nada, someone he had sent there to suffer thousands of years ago. Morpheus claims that other than his creator, Lucifer is perhaps the most powerful being there is, and that should he have a confrontation with him, he has no hope of winning. Now, this statement from Dream obviously only applies to beings that Dream actually knows, but he does know of beings like Mother Night, Father Time, Destiny of the Endless, and Glory of the First Circle, so presumably he at least thinks that Lucifer is stronger than all of these beings. When Dream actually arrives in Hell, he finds its gates unbarred and unguarded. Nada is likewise missing, and the rest of Hell seems to be empty. Feeling that something is up, Dream screams Lucifer's name, and he promptly arrives. Dream admits that he fears Lucifer, who then swears that he will not harm Morpheus as long as they are within the bounds of Hell. You see, Lucifer has quit. He's kicked everyone out, every demon, every tortured soul, and now he'll be closing up hell for good. He takes Dream with him to get rid of the last few stragglers, and tells him that after 10 billion years of rule, he is tired of hell, that he is going to travel to Earth, watch the sunsets, maybe learn to play the piano and open a club. This on its own is obviously a pretty impressive feat. I mean, Lucifer just went ahead and kicked every demon out of hell, whether they wanted to leave or not, you know, including beings like presumably First of the Fallen and Neuron and Belial and tons of other powerful characters just kicked out. I mean, it's probable that they didn't want to mess with Lucifer anyway, but yeah, still impressive. Lucifer goes on to talk about demon kind about how some of them were fallen angels like himself, and others were beings that came here from elsewhere. Uh, and I think this is interesting, because this isn't the only time 
that Lucifer kind of implies that he's a demon or that somebody else outright refers to him as a demon. And there's only one other time where Lucifer goes out of his way to say that he isn't a demon uh, in the recent Volume 3 stuff. So take that as you will. He's certainly considered a demon by other beings, like the masses or whatever, but, but whether he views himself as a demon is a little bit more unclear. It, it's possible that when he abdicated from hell, that's the point he stopped considering himself a demon. That's certainly possible. In any case, he goes on to say that all these beings, all these demons, were far, far weaker than he was, that he could have destroyed any of them, perhaps even all of them at once, without much effort, and chose instead to manipulate them, let them fracture and divide, and plot, but that he no longer cares for such things. He has dream cut off his wings, and once they leave the boundaries of hell, he is no longer bound to his oath, and so, he gives the key of hell to Morpheus, knowing that it will only bring him more trouble. Over the next couple of appearances in Sandman, we see Lucifer doing all the things he said he would. He watches the sunsets for a while, and then moves on to owning a bar. He even learned to play the piano, and is apparently very good at it. One of the two angels, now running hell, Ramil, has come to ask Lucifer to be king of hell again, which he of course refuses telling Remiel that he has no respect for him at all. After Remiel spits on him, Lucifer calmly reminds the angel that when he left hell, he didn't give up any of his powers, gave up none of his skills, that he could wipe out Remiel's existence with ease, and that he simply chooses not to. Uh, I've seen some people say that Lucifer's power is tied to his wings, but this statement basically shows that that's not true at all. He cut his wings off and still had all of his powers. Uh, his wings just allow him to fly and do some other cool stuff that I'll get to later, but they don't make him any stronger, certainly. We also see that it's directly noted that Lucifer is no longer considered the devil. Again, tying into stuff I've said before on this channel, that the title of Devil is given to whoever is currently ruling Hell. We also see him for the final time in Sandman at the funeral of Morpheus. Lucifer would next appear in what is really the beginning of his main stories that had so many people fall in love with him in the first place, that being Lucifer Volume 1 and the miniseries that came before it, Sandman Presents the Morningstar Option. On Earth, it seems as though the wishes of humans have started to be fulfilled at an alarming rate, with 800 people simultaneously winning the lottery as but one example. And if things keep escalating this way, all of creation could pay the price. This hasn't escaped the notice of the Presence and Heaven, who decides to go to Lucifer to ask for help with dealing with this. Lucifer agrees, but only in return for a letter of passage, a way to access another side of the sky, something that even the other angels don't seem to know about, a passage to the overvoid outside creation. We see Lucifer cast some divination magic to help him locate whatever seems to be granting these wishes, and he eventually heads to hell to talk with the angel Duma. Lucifer has realized that this power is coming from some incredibly old gods, born from the belief of humanity at a time when they lacked the ability to speak, the silent gods. Belief in these gods has died down over time, but they are still there. Duma, as the Angel of Silence, is of course aware of these beings and tells Lucifer that he must go down far below creation into the dark to find them. In this pursuit, we see Lucifer use some sympathetic magic to blind two of his assailants, a very Constantine move, I must say, and create a pair of temporary wings with a feather. In an attempt to stop him, the silent gods trap Lucifer in a reflection of a reflection, two abstractions from reality. Lucifer seems to know a rune that would allow him to escape from something less serious, but in this case, he uses Mazikeen's blood to return to the real world. One of Lucifer's 
most well-known abilities is that he's able to simply look at a person and know everything about their lives. In this case, including things like their ancestry, even if they themselves are unaware of it. He calls the world a book, and explains that he is able to do this because some words stand out from the page to him. A truck driver annoys him, so he curses him with the permanent loss of sexual potency, and with a mere gesture, he returns a flesh and bone skinwalker to the stone that it originally was. Finally, he comes before the voiceless gods and throws a knife at them, beginning a battle of wills, and Lucifer, being the Lightbringer, an entity of infinite will, of course wins. Ultimately, the voiceless gods are killed by a wish they themselves granted, turning their own powers inwards. But Lucifer does note specifically that he could have killed these gods himself if he wanted to and simply chose not to. Here is where Lucifer Volume 1 proper begins, and we see that his wings have been collected by the denizens of Hell, and a god from a foreign pantheon, Susano no Mikoto, representing Izanami, is looking to acquire them, which Ramil seems okay with. Lucifer decides that he cannot trust the rite of passage he gained for his previous actions, and goes to visit the Basanos for a reading. He visits another angel known as Melios, the creator of the Basanos. Melios, not wanting to give Lucifer his desires, plans to destroy the Basanos forever, but is himself defeated by them when Lucifer seems to cast a spell that somehow allowed this to happen. Melios is unable to heal from this wound that he is given, and it is revealed that the Basanos themselves are a copy of, and were directly penned from the craftsmanship of the Book of Destiny. A book that details the Presence's plan for creation. Despite this, Lucifer is able to mask his presence from the Basanos by scattering his blood on the wind, and he is confident that he will be able to deal with them in an actual fight. In response to Melios' attempt to betray him and destroy the Basanos, he punishes him, ruining his entire life's work in but a moment. Melios, in response to this, tells us that Lucifer is far older and far greater than even the Angel of Death. The Basanos have settled themselves in a woman known as Jill Presto, and so Lucifer, of course, has to go and find her. Someone working at the club she's at tries to stop Lucifer, who seems to do some weird magic mind hex thing that just makes her super sick. Jill Presto, whilst on stage, begins to use the powers of the Basanos, reaching through time and bringing deaths that should only happen in the future happen now. Lucifer bides his time and waits for the Basanos to waste their strength before he decides to act. At the exact right moment, Mazakin is able to throw her knife, catching the Lightbringer card, and the Basanos are forced to give their divination to Lucifer. This divination reveals that Lucifer will retrieve his wings, that the Basanos will remain his enemy, and that the rite of passage he's been given is a ruse, a one-way ticket. And later, we see the Basanos grant Jill Presto a form of immortality preventing her from being harmed, which will be important later. Back at his club, Lucifer uses the Rite of Passage to cut a hole out into the Overvoid, but rather than go through it, he writes the Presence's name, Yahweh, across it, preventing it from closing without destroying all of creation. Now unfortunately, if I did this all as one video, I think it would be like an hour and a half long. So I'm going to have to end this one here, as I expect to do this in three parts. So that's it for the video. I hope you all enjoyed what I've gone over so far. Let me know what you think about some of these interpretations I speculated on in this video. And if you like me speculating a bit more like this, I sometimes hold back, you know, my thoughts on things because people can get really defensive about their preconceived notions, but I've been feeling a bit more like sharing them recently. In any case, I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you 
in the next one, when I decide to talk about what Lucifer does with his passage into the Overvoid.